Section 31 of Modern Magic. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. The Cups and Balls, Part 2. Pass 3. Having placed a ball under each of the end cups to make them pass successively under the middle cup. Before commencing this pass, the performer, while placing the goblets in line or otherwise engaging the attention of the audience with his left hand, takes from the servant with his right and palms a second ball. He continues, For my next experiment, ladies and gentlemen, I shall require two balls. I need hardly remark that I could instantly supply myself from the wand, but there's a curious faculty about the balls themselves. They have a constant tendency to increase and multiply. For instance, without having recourse to the wand, I can instantly make this one ball into two. He takes up the ball on the table in his left hand, taking care to hold it that all may see that there is nothing else in his hand. And the most curious part of the matter is that, though mathematicians insist that the whole is always greater than its part, in this case, each of the parts will be found precisely equal to the whole. As he speaks, he takes the ball from his, the left hand with the fingers of the right, at the same time dropping the palmed ball into the left hand, and now taking care to so hold his right hand as to show that it contains the one ball only. He then again replaces this ball in the palm of the left hand, where it lies side by side with the second ball. Rubbing the left palm with the second and third fingers of the right, with a circular motion, he gradually lifts the fingers and shows the single ball apparently transformed into two, both of which he places on the table. You will observe that there is nothing under this cup. See, I will place it under this ball. He really palms it. Neither is there anything under either of these two cups, B and A. He lifts the cups, one with each hand, and secretly introduces the palmed ball under B. I take this second ball and place it under this cup, A. He really palms it. We now have a ball under each of these two cups, A and C. I draw the ball out of this one, C. He touches the top of the cup and produces the ball last palmed at his fingertips. I order it to pass under this middle cup, B. He apparently transfers it to the left hand, really palming it, and then makes a motion with the left hand as if passing it into B. It has passed, you see. He raises B with his right hand, showing the ball under it, and in replacing it secretly introduces the second palmed ball. Now I order the ball in this cup, A, to pass in like manner. He waves his wand from A to B and then lifts B. Here it is, and these two outer cups, turning them over with his wand, are perfectly empty. Pass 4. Having placed two balls under the middle cup to make them pass under the two outer ones. You have just seen these two balls pass under the middle cup. Now, by way of variety, we will make them pass out of it. I will take the two balls and place them under the middle cup. He really so places one only, palming the other. You observe that there is nothing either under this, A, nor under this, C. Here he secretly introduces the palmed ball beneath C. Now I order one of the balls under the middle cup to pass under one of the outer cups. Let us see if it has done so. Lifts middle cup with left hand. Yes, see here, only one left. He takes it up and shows it with his right hand, then makes the gesture of replacing it, but really palms it. Let's see where it has gone to. Lifts A with right hand, and in replacing it, secretly introduces the palmed ball under it. It is not under this one, then it must be under this. He lifts C. Yes, here it is. Now I command the other ball in like manner to leave the middle cup and pass under the other. A. Pass. Here it is, you see, and this one, B, is entirely empty. Pass five, to pass three balls in succession under one cup. So far, ladies and gentlemen, what I have shown you has been mere child's play. He drops the right hand carelessly to the Cervante and picks up two more balls, one of which he holds between the fingers and the other in the palm. The real difficulty only begins when we begin to work with three balls. Now, which of these two balls taking up the two balls from the table, is the largest. This one, I fancy, has the advantage, so I will pinch a little piece off to make a third ball. 
he goes through the motion of pinching the ball with the fingers of both hands, at the same moment letting fall the ball in the palm to the fingertips of the right hand. Yes, this will do. It isn't quite round, but that is easily rectified. He rolls it between the fingers. That is better. Now watch me closely, ladies and gentlemen. He places the balls upon the table, with the exception of the fourth, which remains concealed between the fingers. You see that there's nothing under either of the cups. He raises all three and introduces the fourth ball under the middle one, B. He then picks up one of the balls on the table and apparently transfers it to his left hand, really palming it. I command this ball to pass into the middle cup. It has passed, you see. Raising the cup with his right hand and, in replacing it, introducing the ball now palmed. The operation is repeated in like manner until three balls have been shown under the cup, the fourth finally remaining palmed in his right hand. Pass six. To place three balls, one after the other, upon the top of one of the cups and to make them fall through the cup onto the table. At the conclusion of the last pass, the performer had brought three balls under the center cup B, a fourth remaining concealed in his hand. In lifting B to exhibit the three balls and in replacing it beside them, he takes the opportunity of introducing beneath it this fourth ball. He next takes one of the three balls thus exposed and placing it on top of this same goblet, B, covering it with the second goblet, A. Making any appropriate gesture he pleases, he commands the ball to fall through the lower goblet onto the table. He then overturns, without separating, the two goblets, their mouths being toward the spectators, when the ball which he had secretly introduced will be discovered and will appear to be that which the spectators have just seen placed on top of the goblet and which really still remains between the two goblets, and picks up the two goblets together, mouth upward, with his left hand, and with the right hand, takes out that which is now uppermost, B. He turns both the goblets down upon the table, placing A over the ball which he has just shown. If this is neatly done, the other ball, which has remained in A, will not be discovered, but will, as it falls, be covered by A, which will now have beneath it two balls. The performer now places one of the remaining balls on top of A, covering it with either of the other goblets, and again goes through the same process till he has shown the first two, and then three balls under the cup, the fourth remaining at the close of the pass between the two cups last used. Pass 7. To pass three balls in succession upward through the table into one of the cups. You concluded the last pass, we will suppose the reader to represent for the time being the performer, by lifting two cups together to show three balls beneath the undermost. Holding two cups in the left hand, you turn them over mouth upward. Taking with the right hand that which is now uppermost, you place it on the table in the ordinary position, still retaining the other, in which, unknown to the spectators, a fourth ball still remains. You continue, Ladies and gentlemen, you may possibly imagine that there is some trick or sleight of hand in what I have shown you, but I am now about to perform an experiment in which that solution is clearly inadmissible. I propose to pass these three balls, one after the other, through the solid table into this empty goblet. Pray watch me carefully. I take away one of the balls. You take in the right hand one of the three on the table and hold it beneath the table thus. My left hand, as you will observe, is perfectly empty. I have only to say, pass. You palm the ball in the right hand at the same time giving a gentle tap with one finger against the under surface of the table and immediately bring up the hand, taking care, of course, to keep its outer side toward the spectators. Then gently shake the cup which you hold in your left hand and turn the ball out upon the table. Here it is, you see. Now I will put it back in the cup. You pick up the ball with the right hand and drop it into the cup, secretly letting fall with it the palmed ball, and take another ball. You repeat the process, show two balls in the cup, and then again, each time dropping in the palmed ball, and show three, retaining the fourth ball, still palmed in your right hand. Pass eight. To pass two balls in succession from one cup to another without touching them. You again place the three cups in a row on the table, secretly introducing under the right hand cup, C, the ball which remained in your right hand at the close of the last pass. 
and then openly place the other three balls on the tops of the three cups. You then proceed. I will take this ball, that which is on B, and place it under this same cup, B. You really palm it. I take this other ball, that which is upon A, and place it under this cup, A. You secretly introduce with it the ball which you have just palmed. I take this last, that upon C, and place it under this goblet, A, or stay. I will pass it invisibly to this one, C, really palming it. It has passed, you see. You lift C and show the ball which is already there, and in again covering the ball with the cup, you secretly introduce that which you last palmed. You now have in reality two balls under each of the end cups and none under the center one, but the spectators are persuaded that there is one ball under each cup. We now have one ball under each cup. Now I shall command the ball that is under the center cup to pass into either of the end ones at your pleasure. Which shall it be? Whichever is chosen, suppose C, you raise and show the two balls under it. You then ostensibly replace the two balls under C, but really replace the one only, palming the other. You then raise the middle cup, B, to show that it is empty, and in replacing it, introduce the ball you have just palmed under it. Now I shall next order one of the two balls you have just seen under this cup, C, to go and join the one which is already under this one, A. Pass! Here it is, you observe. You raise A to show that there are two balls under it. You also raise C to show that it now only contains one ball and leave all three balls exposed on the table. Pass 9. To make three balls in succession, pass under the middle cup. At the conclusion of the last pass, three balls were left in view, while a fourth, unknown to the audience, was hidden under the middle cup. You proceed, picking up a ball with the right hand. I take this ball and place it under this cup, C, in reality, palming it. I now order it to pass under the middle cup. Presto! Here it is, you see. You raise the middle cup to show that the ball has obeyed your command. And, in again covering the ball, secretly introduce with it that which you have just palmed. I take this one, you pick up another, and place it under this cup, A. Here you palm it as before, and order it also to pass under the middle cup. You raise the middle cup and show that there are now two balls under it, and, in again covering them, introduce the ball which you last palmed. I take this last ball and place it under this cup, C, palming it, whence I shall command it to again depart and join its companions under the middle cup. This time it shall make it the journey visibly. You take your wand in the left hand, and with it touch the cup C. Here it is, you see, on the end of my wand. You don't see it? Why, surely it is visible enough. Look. You pretend to produce the palmed ball from the wand and exhibit it to the company. You can all see it now. You lay down the wand and go through the motion of transferring the ball to the left hand, really palming it in its passage. Now then, pray watch me closely, and you will see it pass under the cup. One, two, three. You make the gesture of throwing it through the middle cup and open the hand to show it empty, immediately turning over the goblets to show that there are three balls under the middle and none under the outer ones. Pass 10, the multiplication pass. For the purpose of this pass, it is necessary to borrow a hat, which you hold in the left hand. You then place the three balls in a row upon the table and cover each with one of the cups. It will be remembered that a fourth ball remains palmed in your right hand. You now lift up the right hand goblet, C, and place it on the table close beside the ball which it lately covered, and, as you do so, secretly introduce beneath it the palmed ball. You pick up, with the right hand, the ball which you have thus uncovered, and go through the motion of dropping it into the hat, really palming it in the moment during which the hand is concealed inside the hat and at the same moment simulating, by a gentle tap against the inside, the sound which the ball would make if actually dropped into the hat. You next lift B in like manner, introducing the ball just palmed beneath it, and go through the motion of placing the second ball, which is thereby left exposed in the hat. 
you do the same at the third cup, then return to the first, which the spectators believe to now be empty, and from which they are astonished to see you produce another ball, continuing till you have raised each cup in succession eight or ten times, and on each occasion of lifting a cup to uncover a ball, introducing beneath it the ball which you had just previously palmed. To the eyes of the spectators, who believe that the balls are really dropped into the hat, the effect will be exactly as if new balls, by some mysterious process of reproduction, came under the cups at each time of raising them. When you think your audience are sufficiently astonished, you remark, I think we have about enough now, the hat's just getting rather heavy. Will someone hold a handkerchief to receive the balls? When the handkerchief is spread out, you carefully turn over the hat, and the general astonishment will be intensified at discovering that it contains nothing. There is, of course, a ball left under each of the cups, and a fourth palmed in your right hand. This letter will not again be wanted, and you should, therefore, while attention is drawn to the hat, drop it upon the servante or into one of your pochettes. Pass 11. To transform the small balls to larger ones. While the attention of the spectators is still occupied by the unexpected denouement of the last pass, you should prepare for this one by secretly taking with your right hand from the servant and palming, by either the second or third method, the first being only available for the small balls, one of the larger balls. You then address the spectators to the following effect. Ladies and gentlemen, you see that I have little difficulty in increasing the number of balls to an unlimited extent. I will now repeat the experiments in another form and show you that it is equally easy to make them increase in size. You will observe that, notwithstanding the number of balls which I have just produced from the cups, there are still plenty more to come. Here you raise C and show that there is a ball still under it. You replace it on the table at a few inches distance and, as you do so, secretly introduce under it the larger ball which you have just palmed. Taking up the small ball in your right hand, you say, To make the experiment still more surprising, I will pass the ball upward through the table into the cup. So saying, you place the right hand under the table, dropping as you do so the little ball which you hold on the servante, and taking in its place another of the larger balls. Pass, you exclaim, and at the same time giving a gentle rap on the under surface of the table. You bring the hand up again as if empty. You do not touch the first cup, but repeat the operation with the second, B, and again with A, on each occasion passing the hand under the table, exchanging a small ball for a larger one, and immediately afterward introducing the latter under the cup next in order. The last time, however, you merely drop the small ball on the servante, without bringing up any other in exchange. You have now, unknown to the audience, one of the larger or medium-sized balls under each of the cups. And if you're about to end with this pass, you would merely lift the cups and show the balls, thus apparently increased in size underneath. We will assume, however, that you propose to exhibit the pass next following, one of the most effective, in which case the necessary preparation must be made in the act of raising the cups, and we shall therefore proceed at once, while the balls still remain covered, to describe Pass 12, to again transform the balls to still larger ones. The last pass, having reached the stage we have just described, that is, a large ball being under each cup, but not yet exhibited to the audience, you secretly take in your left hand from the servante one of the still larger balls. These balls should be soft and elastic, and of such a size that, if pressed lightly into the cup, they shall require a slight tap of the cup on the table to dislodge them. Having taken the ball in the left hand, you hold it at the ends of the fingers behind the table, as near the top as possible consistently with its being out of sight of the spectators. Then saying, Now, ladies and gentlemen, I must ask for your very closest attention. You raise C with the right hand, and with the same movement lower it for a moment behind the table, and over the ball in the left hand, which remains in the cup of its own accord. All eyes go instinctively to the ball on the table, whose increased size is a new phenomenon. Not one in a hundred will, in this first moment of surprise, think of watching the cup, which is naturally supposed to have, for the moment, concluded its share of the trick. You then replace the cup on the table, lightly, so as to not loosen the ball. Meanwhile, getting ready another ball in the left hand, 
and repeat the operation with B. With A, you make a slight variation in your mode of procedure. Taking a third ball in your left hand, you hold it as before, but, as if through carelessness or clumsiness, allow it to be seen for a moment above the edge of the table. When you raise the third cup, you move it behind the table as before, and make a feint of introducing the ball which the spectators have just seen, but really let it drop on the servante and replace the cup empty. A murmur from the audience will quickly apprise you that they have, as they imagine, found you out. Looking as innocent as you can, you inquire what is the matter, and are informed that you are seen to introduce a ball into the cup. I beg your pardon, you reply, lifting up, however, not A, which you have just replaced, but C, which is the farthest remote from it. There really is a ball in this cup, but having been pressed in and fitting tightly, it does not fall. The audience, seeing you raise the wrong cup, are more and more confirmed in their suspicion. Not that one, the other, they exclaim. You next raise B, the ball in which also does not fall, for the reason already stated. No, no, the audience shout, the other cup, the end one. You really are very obstinate, gentlemen, you reply, but pray satisfy yourselves, turning over A as you speak, and showing the inside, which is manifestly empty, and your critics rapidly subside. Meanwhile, you drop your left hand to the servante, and secretly take from it two similar balls. Then addressing the audience, you say, Surely, gentlemen, you don't imagine that if I wanted to place a ball under a cup, I should set about it in such a clumsy fashion as this. As you say this, you place your left hand in your left pocket, as if taking a ball from thence. As it obviously would not do to give the audience cause to suspect the existence of a secret receptacle behind the table and bring out again the two balls, but only allow one to be seen, keeping the other concealed in the palm. Bringing the cup over the hand, you squeeze in both balls as far as you can, when the innermost will remain, but the outermost, not having sufficient space, will drop out again on the table. The audience, not knowing that there are two balls, believe the cup, which you now replace on the table, to be empty. You continue, No, gentlemen, when I pass a ball under the cup, you may be sure that I don't let anybody see me do so. As you speak, you take the ball on the table in your right hand and make the movement of transferring it to your left, really palming it by the second method and holding the left hand closed and high as if containing it and keeping your eyes fixed thereon, you carelessly drop your right hand till the fingertips rest on the table when you are able to let fall the ball upon the servante. You continue, I will now pass this ball under either of the cups which you like to name. Indeed, I will do more. I will cause this ball invisibly to multiply itself into three, one of which shall pass under each of the cups. First, however, let me show you that there is nothing under the cups at present. You raise each in turn. Nothing here, nothing here, and nothing here. The balls still adhere to the sides of the cups, which therefore appear to be empty but you replace each with a slight rap on the table and thereby loosen the ball within it. Now then, you bring the two hands together and gently rub them over each cup in turn, finally parting them and showing that both are empty, and then lifting the cups to show the three large balls underneath. Some performers, in lifting each cup with the right hand, introduce a fresh ball held in the left, as already explained. The effect is the same as in the multiplication pass already described, with this difference, that on each occasion of uncovering a ball, the ball remains on the table, which thus becomes gradually covered with an ever-increasing number of balls. Some, again, conclude this apparently producing from the cups apples much larger than they could naturally contain, e.g. large apples, Spanish onions, etc. This is effected in the same manner as the introduction of the large balls just described, save that, in this case, the object, which cannot really go into the cup, is merely held against its mouth with the third finger of the right hand and dropped with a slight shake, as if there was a difficulty in getting it out. There are many other cup and ball passes, but the series above given will be found as effective as any. If any reader desires to follow the subject further, we would refer him to Recreations Mathematiques et Physiques of Goyot, already quoted, or another old work under the same title by Ozanam, in which this branch of prestidigitation is treated at considerable length. End of section 31. Recording by April Walters.
Section 32 of Modern Magic. Recording by Shelley Stephen. Farmington Hills, Michigan. ShelleyStephen.com. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Section 32. Chapter 14. Ball Tricks Requiring Special Apparatus. Before proceeding to the description of the tricks which form the subject of this chapter, it may be well to mention one or two principles of sleight of hand, not yet noticed, which have a special application to ball tricks and are also useful with regard to oranges, apples, eggs, etc. The pass called the tourniquet, or French drop, described already in relation to coin, will be found equally applicable to balls up to a couple of inches in diameter, but is not available for objects of larger size. Balls of larger diameter are best palmed by one or other of the methods following. First method. Taking the ball in either hand, the performer tosses the ball from palm to palm at a few inches distance, four or five times, finally making the motion of tossing it from the right hand to the left, but really retaining it in the right by a slight contraction of the palm and at the same time closing and elevating the left hand and following it with the eyes as though it contained the ball. It is obvious that a ball of this size now under consideration, say of two to three inches in diameter, would not admit of the hand containing it being perfectly closed. And this must be borne in mind in the position of the left hand, the fingers of which must not be tightly closed as they would if apparently containing a coin or other very small article but merely curved inward, the palm, of course, being turned toward the performer's own body so as not to disclose the secret of its emptiness. Where the hand of the performer is small, or the ball is of such a size as not to be readily retained in the right hand by the contraction of the palm, the thumb may be used to assist in supporting it. Second method. Taking the ball between his open hands, the performer rolls it round and round between his palms as though it were a lump of clay which he was molding into a spherical form, and in doing so, gradually turns his hands until the back of his right hand is undermost, when, with an inward movement of that hand towards himself, he palms the ball therein and at the same time closing and elevating the left hand as described for the last method. to vanish a large ball with the aid of the table. First method. Standing behind his table, the ball being some six or eight inches from its hinder edge, the performer places both hands round it, apparently picking it up and bringing it forward between his two hands, from which, however, the ball is, on examination, found to have vanished. Its disappearance is effected as follows. At the moment when the performer encircles the ball with his hands, he gives, with the little finger of the hand which is innermost, and therefore unseen by the audience, a quick jerk to the ball, which is thereby made to roll towards the hinder edge of the table and drop upon the servant, on which there should be a padded box or basket to receive it. The action is wholly concealed from the spectators by the hands, which, with the exception of the finger which does the work, should remain motionless. Second method. Standing behind his table, as in the last case, the performer tosses up the ball and catches it again three or four times, keeping the hands low so as to be near the edge of the table. The hands naturally sink in the act of catching the ball, and after having caught it once or twice, the performer, as he lowers them, drops it on the servant, immediately raising them again with the action of throwing up the ball taking care to follow it with the eyes in its imaginary flight. If this is done neatly, the eyes of the spectators will instinctively travel in the same direction, and the effect to them will be as if the ball vanished at its highest point of its upward flight instead of disappearing as it really does at the moment of reaching the hands in its fall. This method may also be employed for objects other than of spherical shape. Third method. The performer, standing behind his table as before, and placing the ball thereon, covers it with the right hand and rolls it round and round in circles, 
each time bringing it nearer and nearer to the hinder edge of the table till it finally rolls over and drops upon the servant. He continues the motion of the hand for two or three turns as though the ball were still under it, gradually working back towards the center of the table, the effect to the spectator being as if the ball melted away under the operator's fingers. Fourth method. This is generally employed to apparently pass one object into another, say, a small ball into a large one. The performer, standing a little behind his table, with his right side slightly turned to the spectators, takes in his right hand the small ball and in his left the large one. The latter he holds about shoulder high, keeping his eyes fixed upon it and remarking, I shall now pass this small ball into this large one. He draws back and lowers the right arm as though to give it impetus as one naturally does in the act of throwing. This brings the right hand just over the padded box or basket on the servant and allows him to drop the small ball therein. Without any pause, he brings the right hand smartly up to the left, describing a tolerably wide arc in its transit, and then separating his hands shows that the smaller ball has vanished, having apparently passed into the large one. This sleight is not confined to objects of spherical form, but may be used with any article of convenient size. With this introduction, we shall now proceed to describe a few of the more popular ball tricks. The ball box. The leading idea of most of the tricks which we are about to describe is the magical appearance or disappearance of a ball. So far, they resemble the cup and ball tricks described in the last chapter, but with this difference that in the case of the present series, the main effect is produced by mechanical means, any sleight of hand employed being rather an accessory than the leading feature. The oldest and simplest of the mechanical appliances for this purpose is that known as the ball box, consisting of a box two to six inches in height of the shape shown in figure 127 and containing a ball which just fills it. The box consists of three portions, the lower portion, or box proper, A, the lid, C, and an intermediate portion, B, being a hollow hemisphere colored externally in imitation of the ball and so fitted with reference to the box and lid that it may be either lifted off with the lid, leaving the box apparently empty, or may be left upon the box when the lid is removed the effect to the eye being as if the ball had returned to the box. The ball box is generally of turned boxwood and is scored with concentric circles which serve to disguise its double opening. Simply stated, its effect is as follows. The solid ball is first shown in the box and then openly taken from it and the box covered with the lid. The ball is then got rid of in one or other of the modes before described, and a pretense is made of passing it invisibly into the box. The lid is removed without the intermediate portion B, and the ball appears to have returned to the box. Again, the lid is replaced and again removed, but this time B is removed with it, and the box again appears empty. The trick in this form is to be found in every toy shop is so well known as to produce scarcely any illusion, but its transparency may be considerably diminished by previously palming, in the right hand, the movable shell B, the convex side being inward, and then handing round the remaining portions and solid ball for inspection. When they are returned, the performer apparently places the ball in the box, but really makes a secret exchange and places B in the box instead. Upon again removing the lid, and with it B, the ball has disappeared, and as the audience have, as they believe, inspected the whole apparatus, the mode of its disappearance is not quite so obvious as in the first case. At best, however, the ball box in this its pristine form is a clumsy and inartistic contrivance and has long been relegated to the juvenile and country fair school of conjuring. There is, however, an improved apparatus for producing a similar effect, which is generally worked in couples under the name of the red and black ball vases. 
The receptacle for the ball is, in this case, made in the form of a neat vase without any of the telltale grooves which disfigure the older ball box. See Figure 128. Like its prototype, it is in three parts, which we will distinguish as before by the letters A, B, and C. The portion B, however, in this case goes completely within the lid C, within which it fits just tightly enough to be lifted off with it. When, however, the performer desires to leave B upon A, he presses down, in the act of lifting off the cover, a movable button or stud at the top. This pushes out the shell B from the cover and, when the latter is lifted, leaves it upon A. When used in pairs, the ball vases are usually made with one red and one black ball, the shells B of each vase being also one black and one red. The balls are first offered for examination, after which the red ball is placed in the vase containing the black shell and the black ball in that which contains the red shell. The vases are then covered and on the covers being again removed, leaving the hollow shells upon the vases, the red ball being covered by the black shell and the black ball by the red shell. The effect to the spectator is as if the two balls had changed places. By leaving alternately the one or the other shell over its respective vase, the ball in the opposite vase being left uncovered, the vases may be made to appear as if both containing red balls or both black balls, the genuine balls being finally again exhibited as at first. There is yet another form of ball box, also frequently worked in pairs and designed to simulate the apparent passage of a ball from the one box to the other. The vase in this case consists of two parts only, the vase proper A and the cover B, but the latter is of such a height as to completely contain the ball and of such a size internally that if the ball be jerked up into the cover, it will not again fall unless a slight shake be used to displace it. See figure 129. Each vase has its own ball and the mode of use is as follows. One of the vases is prepared beforehand by jerking up the ball into the cover, which may then be removed, showing the vase apparently empty. Or both may first be shown empty and the ball then introduced secretly under the cover after the manner of the cups and balls. The remaining vase and ball are offered for inspection and when they are returned, the ball is placed within and covered over, after which the closed vase is placed upon the table. But in the act of doing this, the performer gives the apparatus a slight upward jerk, thereby causing the ball therein to rise into the cover where it remains. The second vase is once more shown as empty, but replacing it on the table, the performer puts it down sharply, thereby causing the ball to drop from the cover into the cup. He now orders the ball, which the company have seen placed in the first vase, to pass invisibly into the second, and on again opening the two, this transition will appear to have taken place, and by a repetition of the process, the ball may be made to travel backwards and forwards from one vase to the other. Morrison's Pillbox In this trick, called by French conjurers la pilule du diable, the device of the shell is carried still further. The box in this case is spherical, standing upon a thin stem, see figure 130, and each part, box proper and lid, contains a half shell, the edge of one having a rebate or holder so as to fit into the other, the two conjoined having the appearance of a solid ball. The genuine ball is of such a size as to just fill the hollow shells when thus joined. The lower shell fits loosely in the box and the upper one a little more tightly so as not to fall out unless pressed down by the button on the top of the lid, which not only loosens it from the lid, but presses it into the union with the lower shell. The mode of using the apparatus is as follows. It is first brought forward with the one half shell in the box and the other in the lid, 
the true ball, which is of the same color as the shell, generally black, being placed within the lower shell. The ball is ostentatiously removed and the box closed. The box is then either placed in some piece of apparatus adapted to cause its disappearance or is made to vanish by sleight of hand in one or other of the modes already described. The ball is now ordered to return to the box, which, for greater certainty, is once more shown empty. The performer again closes it, pressing as he does so the button on the top of the lid, thus compelling the two half shells to coalesce. On again reopening the box, the ball has, to all appearance, returned as commanded. The ball box now under consideration has this great advantage over the single shell vases, that the sham ball can be completely removed from the box and shown on all sides, thus, apparently, negativing the possibility of its being a shell only. The trick may also be worked very effectively by using a genuine ball of a different color to the shell, with the addition of a duplicate of each. Thus, if the shell be black, you must be provided with a solid ball of the same color and two red balls. One of the latter, as also the solid black ball, should be of such a size as to go inside the shell, the remaining red ball being of the same size as the shell in its complete condition. The half shells being in their place in the box, the performer brings it forward together with the smaller red and black ball keeping the remaining red ball concealed in his palm. Borrowing a handkerchief, he wraps, apparently, the black ball therein and gives it to someone to hold, really substituting the palmed red ball and getting rid of the black ball as soon as he can into one of his secret pockets. He then places the remaining red ball in the box and, having covered it over, commands the black ball in the handkerchief to change places with the red one in the box. Upon examination, the change has apparently taken place, the red ball in the box being now enclosed within the hollow shell and thus having all the appearance of the solid black ball. The ball which changes to a rose. This is little more than an enlarged edition of the apparatus just described, the ball in Morrison's pill box being generally of about an inch and a half in diameter, while in the present case, the ball is nearly double that size. See figure 131. The only other difference is the addition of a short pin, about a sixteenth of an inch in length, projecting from the bottom of the cup and fitting into a corresponding hole in the lower shell. The addition of this pin enables the performer, after having pressed the stud at top, and thus cause the ball to appear in the previously empty box to again cause its disappearance. This is effected by opening the box with a slight lateral pressure when the pin acts as a stop or check to hold back the lower shell, and the shells which are in this instance made to fit rather more loosely together are thus forced to separate again, the lower being left in the cup and the upper in the lid as before. This apparatus is generally used with a solid black ball and a couple of artificial rosebuds as nearly alike as possible. The apparatus is brought forward empty and with the solid ball and one of the rosebuds is handed to the audience for inspection. The two half shells joined together so as to form a hollow ball with the second rosebud within are placed ready to hand in one of the pockets of the performer. The audience having duly examined the apparatus, the performer returns to his table, secretly exchanging as he does so the solid for the hollow ball. This latter he places openly in the cup, taking care that the hole in the lower shell duly corresponds with the pin at bottom and puts on the cover. He now announces that the ball which he has just placed in the cup will at command fly away and that the rosebud which he holds shall take its place. The disappearance of the visible rosebud is effected in any way that the invention or the appliances at command of the performer may suggest. And on the box being opened, so as to part the two shells, the ball has apparently disappeared and the rose has taken its place. 
By again closing the box, and this time pressing the stud on the top, the flower may again be made to vanish, and the ball to reappear in its original position. The popular trick of the flower in the buttonhole, which will be described under the head of miscellaneous tricks, may be used in conjunction with this apparatus, the ball being found in the place of the flower, while the latter is made to appear in the buttonhole. A similar apparatus to the one above is sometimes made in metal and of a size sufficient to enclose a cannonball, which being made to disappear, its place is supplied by a variety of articles which have been otherwise disposed of at an earlier period. The Obedient Ball This trick is of Japanese origin and from that circumstance is sometimes known as the Japanese ball. It is performed with a large black wooden ball about 5 inches in diameter with a hole bored through it from side to side. A piece of stout rope, 4 or 5 feet in length, with a knot at one end, completes the apparatus. The performer commences by passing the rope through the ball and the hands both for examination. The ball is found to run loosely upon the rope and both are manifestly quite free from mechanism or preparation. The articles being returned, the performer places his foot upon the knotted end of the rope and, taking the other end in his right hand, holds it in a perpendicular position. The ball is raised as far as the length of rope will admit and, on being again released, immediately runs down again, as would naturally be expected. The performer now announces that, in obedience to his will, the laws of gravity will be, in this particular instance, suspended. Accordingly, on his again raising the ball to any portion of the rope, it remains stationary at that height until released by his command, when it instantly runs down. Other persons are invited to come forward and to place the ball at any height they please, the ball again remaining stationary until released by the word of the operator, when it slowly descends, stopping, however, in its course and remaining fixed whenever commanded by the performer to do so. The secret lies in the fact that the hole in the ball is not made straight from end to end, but curved with an angle or break in the middle. See figure 132. So long as the rope is slack, it runs through easily enough, but as soon as it is drawn taut and thus forced into a straight line, it is clipped by the opposite angles A, B, and C, creating an amount of friction which would support a much greater weight than that of the ball. The performer has, therefore, only to draw the rope taut when he desires the ball to remain stationary and to slacken when he desires it to run down. There is another form of the obedient ball, designed for drawing room use. The ball in this case is about two and a half inches in diameter and the bore is straight, but tapering from a quarter of an inch at the one opening to about half an inch at the other. The cord used is a thin piece of whip cord, and the ball therefore runs quite loosely upon it. There is, however, in this case an additional element in the apparatus, consisting of a little black wooden plug about an inch in length and tapering so as to fit midway into the bore of the ball. See figure 133, in which A represents a nearly full-size view of the plug in question. The plug is bored after the manner of the large ball, the hole being of such a size as to just allow the cord to run through it. This plug is secretly threaded upon the cord before commencing the trick. The cord, which in this case has a tassel instead of a knot at one end, being passed through it from the larger end. This plug is kept concealed in the hand of the performer, and the string being allowed to dangle down on either side of it. The ball is handed round for examination, and when returned, the cord is passed through it from the side which has the larger opening. The ball is then allowed to drop quickly to the full extent of the cord. As it runs down, it encounters the plug, which is thereby placed in position within the ball, and both run down together until stopped by the tassel. From this point, the working of the trick is the same as with the larger ball. End of section 32.
Section thirty three of Modern Magic. Recording by Wendy Almeida. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Chapter fifteen Hat Tricks. The present chapter will be devoted to those tricks in which a hat plays a special or prominent part. Borrowed hats have been used in the course of many of the tricks already described, but the part played by the hat has been of an incidental and subordinate character. In the tricks next following, the hat is the principal article employed. The majority of hat tricks are different modifications of the same broad idea, viz. the production from a borrowed and apparently empty hat of various articles in size and number much exceeding what any hat could in the natural way contain. One of the best is that of the cannonballs in the hat. The earliest and simplest form of this trick is limited to the production of a solid wooden globe, blacked to resemble a cannonball. The introduction of the ball into the hat is effected as follows. The ball, which has a hole of about two inches in depth by one in diameter bored in it towards its center, is placed on the servant of the performer's table in such manner that the hole above mentioned shall slant upwards and outwards at an angle of about 45 degrees. To keep the ball steady and to prevent its rolling off, some performers have a slight circular hollow scooped in the surface of the servant itself. A more convenient plan, however, is to use an india rubber ring, such as is given to infants teething. This may be placed on any part of the servant and makes a capital rest or bed for the ball. A bit of half-inch rope with the ends joined so as to form a ring will answer the same purpose. When the performer desires to introduce the ball into the hat, which we will suppose to have been borrowed for the purpose of some previous trick just completed, he takes the hat with his thumb outside and his fingers inside the brim, and holds it up with its mouth towards the spectators, so as to show indirectly that it is empty. See figure 134. Carelessly lowering his hand, he brings the hat mouth downwards on the table, and, drawing it towards him, slips the second finger into the hole in the ball. See figure 135. When the mere action of crooking the finger brings the ball into the hat, he then, still holding the ball supported by the finger, walks away from the table towards the owner of the hat with the apparent intention of returning it. Just before reaching him, however, he pretends to notice that it is somewhat heavy, and looking into it says, Dear me, sir, there is something rather peculiar about this hat. Are you aware that there is something in it? The owner naturally professes ignorance of the fact, and the performer, after keeping the audience in suspense for a moment or two, turns the hat over and lets the ball fall out upon the stage. The performer may in some degree heighten the effect of the trick by making it appear that the ball is wedged very tightly in the hat, as the difficulty of introducing it becomes thereby presumably the greater. This is managed by holding the hat with both hands, as shown in figure 136, when the extended fingertips will prevent the ball from falling as long as may be desired, however much the hat may be shaken. The trick, as above described, is of very short duration. In order to lengthen, and at the same time to diversify it, a second ball is sometimes employed, of similar appearance, but of different construction. This second ball, see figures 137, 138, the latter representing a section of the ball, is a strongly made hollow sphere of tin or zinc with a circular opening of about three and a half inches across, closed by a sort of sliding door, A, also circular, working on two curved arms, B, B, which move on two pivots, C, C, at opposite sides of the ball on the inside. In this door is a hole an inch in diameter, answering the same purpose as the hole bored in the solid ball. The ball is filled beforehand with bonbons, small toys, or any other articles suitable for production. 
Thus loaded, it is placed upon the servant and introduced into the hat as above described. The performer goes through the ceremony of pretending to discover something in the hat, but does not, as in the last case, at once produce the ball. Slipping back the sliding door, he brings out one by one the articles contained in the ball, not hurriedly, but with deliberation, as he thereby produces the effect of greater quantity. Having emptied the ball, he again closes the circular slide, remarking that the hat is now quite empty. As a proof that it is so, he turns the hat mouth downwards as above directed, preventing the ball from falling with the tips of his fingers. Again he moves towards the owner, as if to return the hat, and again pretends to find something in it. This time, however, he does not allow the ball to fall on the ground, as being hollow it will not bear rough usage, but lifts it out with his left hand taking care that the door side shall be downwards, next his palm. Observing that he will have the ball packed up for the owner of the hat to take home with him, he returns to his table and places it thereon. As the ball was in his left hand, the right is still holding the hat, and this gives him the opportunity to introduce the second, i.e. the solid cannonball, which should be placed in readiness at the opposite corner of the servant. This also is produced in due course, and, being manifestly solid, naturally leads the audience to infer that the other was so also. What are known as multiplying balls are frequently used in conjunction with the cannon balls. These are cloth-covered balls of about two and a half inches in diameter. In appearance they are solid, but in reality are mere outer coverings of cloth, kept distended by spiral skeletons of wire, see figure 139, and may be pressed quite flat, in which condition they occupy an exceedingly small space, though they immediately regain their shape on being released. A large number of these may be packed in the hollow cannonball, and when taken out, produce a pile extending far above the mouth of the hat, the cannonball lying hidden beneath them. The hollow ball may also be filled with soft feathers, of which what will seem an incredible quantity when spread out may be compressed into a very small space. Feathers are, however, objectionable in a drawing room, from the difficulty of collecting them from the carpet. The Hundred Goblets from a Hat The goblets used for this purpose are of polished tin, about four inches in depth, and made without ornament or projection of any kind. Being all of the same size and slightly tapering, a large number of them may be fitted one within the other, and yet occupy little more space than a single one. The goblets thus packed are placed in a bag of black alpaca, just large enough to receive them, and concealed on the servant or in one of the profonde of the performer. When it is desired to introduce them into the hat, they are grasped in either hand, the back of the hand being turned towards the audience and thus covering them. The hand is now carelessly placed in the hat as though to take something out. Once introduced, the goblets are produced one by one and placed mouth downward on the table, their number giving an appearance of bulk which seems to exclude the possibility of their having been all contained within so small a space. Two or three parcels of goblets may be introduced successively and brought out one by one with little difficulty. We may here mention a little expedient, which will be found of great assistance, where the performer desires to introduce into a hat a bundle of goblets, or any similar article, from either of his secret pockets. We will suppose that the article in question is in the right hand profonde. Taking the empty hat in the opposite hand, the left, he stoops a little, and holding it down near the floor with its mouth toward the company, gently moves it round and round in circles, gazing at it intently, as though anticipating some important result. This draws all eyes to the hat, and enables him to drop his right hand to the profonde, and bring out, under cover of the hand and wrist, the article to be introduced. 
Continuing the motion, he gradually brings the mouth of the hat upwards so that the company can no longer see into it, and suddenly plunges his right hand into it, as though merely to take out the article or articles which he, in fact, thereby introduces. This may be repeated from the profonde on the opposite side, and thus two successive packets of articles may be produced without even going near the table. A dozen babies from a hat. Among the various objects available for production may be enumerated dolls, of which a dozen, each eight or nine inches in height, may be produced from a borrowed hat. The dolls for this purpose are of colored muslin, stretched over a framework or skeleton of spiral wire, after the fashion of the multiplying balls, see figure 140, and may be compressed vertically to a thickness of about three-quarters of an inch. A dozen of them may be packed within the hollow cannonball described above, resuming their shape as soon as they are released. The Magic Reticules this is one of the most modern hat tricks. The reticules, which are of cardboard covered with leather, are, when expanded, as shown in figure 141. They are, however, constructed so as to fold into a very small compass in manner following. The ends, AA, are only attached to the reticule at their lower edges, which form a kind of leather hinge, and may be folded inwards flat upon the bottom of the reticule. See figure 142. The ends of the ribbon B, which forms the sling or handle of the reticule, run freely through two holes, CC, in the upper side of the reticule, and are attached to the ends AA at the points D, D. The ends being folded down, as in figure 142, the reticule becomes a hollow oblong, open from end to end, as in figure 143. The angles, being made of soft leather, are flexible, and by pressing the sides in the direction indicated by the dotted lines, see figure 143, the reticule is brought into the condition shown in figure 144, and, on being again folded, into that shown in figure 145, in which condition it is little larger than a pocketbook. Half a dozen reticules thus folded and packed in a bag of black alpaca or held together by an India rubber ring form a small and compact parcel and are easily introduced into the hat. The performer, having got them out of the bag, has only to unfold each so as to bring it into the condition shown in figure 144, when the mere act of lifting the reticule out of the bag by the ribbon B raises the sides and ends and restores it to the shape shown in figure 141. The Drums from the Hat in this trick, the performer generally begins by producing from the hat a number of the multiplying balls described at page 307. He next produces a miniature drum, prettily ornamented, then another, then a third and a fourth, each being a shade larger than its predecessor, and the last of such a size as barely to be containable within the hat. With the reader's present knowledge, he will readily conjecture that the drums are so constructed as to fit one within the other, the multiplying balls being packed within the smallest of the four. One end of each drum is loose and falls inwards upon the opposite end, upon which it lies flat, thus giving space for the introduction of another drum a size smaller. Across the loose end, and parallel to it, is fixed a wire, forming a handle whereby the performer may lift the drum out of the hat, the act of doing so raising the end into its proper position, and a wire rim round the inside of each drum preventing the loose end being drawn out altogether. Each drum is taken out with the loose end upwards. But the performer, in placing it on the table, turns it over, thus bringing the solid end up. In default of this precaution, the loose end would fall back again to its old position, and so betray the secret. The drums are usually made oval rather than round, as they are thus better suited to the shape of a hat.
the bird cages from the hat. Not content with cannonballs, drums, and ladies' reticules, the public of the present day requires that bird cages and living birds should be produced from an empty hat. The bird cages used vary in their construction. Some are made to fit one within the other, after the fashion of the drums just described, save that the bird cages, unlike the drums, are lifted out by the solid and not the loose ends, which fall down of their own accord. Those in most general use, however, are of the shape shown in figure 146, and are alike in size, measuring about six inches in height by five in breadth and depth. The bottom is made to slide upwards on the upright wires which form the sides. When it is desired to prepare the cage for use, a canary is first placed therein, and the bottom is then pushed up as far as it will go. See figure 147. The sides, which work on hinges at AAAA, being folded one by one upon the bottom, the cage finally assuming the shape shown in figure 148. It is in this condition that the cages, generally three in number, are introduced into the hat, either from the servant or from inside the vest of the performer. And in the act of lifting out, which is done by the wire loop at top, the sides and bottom falling down, the cage again becomes as in figure 146. The cake or pudding in the hat. This is an old and favorite hat trick. The necessary apparatus consists of two parts. First, a round tin pan, A, see figure 149, four inches in depth and tapering from five inches at its greatest to four and a half inches at its smallest diameter. It is open at each end, but is divided into two parts by a horizontal partition at about two-thirds of its depth. Second, a larger tin, B, japanned to taste, five and a half inches in depth, and so shaped as to fit somewhat tightly over the smaller tin. In the larger end of the latter is placed a hot cake or pudding, and in this condition it is placed on the servant of the table, projecting a little over the edge. The performer borrows a hat, and in passing behind his table, tips cake and tin together into it. The chances are that the tin will fall small end upwards, the opposite end being the heaviest. But if not, the performer turns the tin so as to bring it into that position. Placing the hat mouth upwards on the table, he announces his intention of making a cake in it for which purpose he takes one by one and mixes in the tin B a quantity of flour, raisins, eggs, sugar, and the other ingredients for a cake, adding water enough to make the mixture into a thick batter. This he pours into the hat, holding the tin with both hands, at first high above it, but gradually bringing it lower and lower, till at last, as if draining the last drop of the mixture, he lowers the mouth of the tin right into the hat and brings it well down over the smaller tin. On being again raised, it brings away within it the smaller tin and its liquid contents, the cake being left in the hat. He next proceeds to bake the cake by moving the hat backwards and forwards at a short distance over the flame of a candle, and after a sufficient interval exhibits the result, which is cut up and handed round to the company for their approval. As the batter round the sides of B is apt to cause A to stick pretty tightly into it, a folding ring is generally fixed inside A in order to facilitate its removal after the close of the trick. The Welsh Rabbit. This is a trick of a comic character, and in the hands of a spirited performer is sure to be received with applause, particularly by the younger members of the audience. Its effect is as follows. The performer brings in in one hand a saucepan, fancifully decorated, and in the other a plate with bread, cheese, pepper, etc. With these ingredients he proposes to make a Welsh Rabbit and to give the audience, without extra charge, a lesson in cookery. 
chopping the bread and cheese together in a burlesque fashion and seasoning with pepper and salt to a degree which no palate short of a salamander's could possibly stand, he shovels all into the saucepan and claps the lid on. For a moment he is at a loss for a fire, but this difficulty is quickly conquered. Borrowing a gentleman's hat and a lady's pocket handkerchief, he requests permission to use them for the purpose of the experiment. This is readily accorded, but the respective owners look on with consternation when the performer proceeds to set fire to the handkerchief and, dropping it still blazing into the hat, to cook the Welsh rabbit by moving the saucepan to and fro over the flames. Having done this for a minute or two, he extinguishes the flames by lowering the saucepan for a moment into the hat. Then again removing it and taking off the lid, he brings it forward to the company and exhibits not the expected Welsh rabbit or rare bit, but a genuine live rabbit, every vestige of the cheese and other ingredients having disappeared. The secret of this ingenious trick lies mainly in the construction of the saucepan, which consists of four parts designated in the diagram figure 150, by the letters A, B, C, and D. A is the lid, which has no speciality, save that the rim round it is rather deeper than usual. B is a shallow tray or lining of the same depth as the lid, fitting easily within the top of the saucepan. A, on the contrary, fits tightly within B. C is the body of the saucepan and has no speciality. D is an outer sheet or covering, loosely fitting the lower part of the saucepan, and, like it, is japanned plain black, the upper part and lid being generally of an ornamental pattern. For our own part, we much prefer either plain black or polished tin throughout, as savoring less of mechanism or preparation. The presence or absence of D does not alter the general appearance of the saucepan and cannot therefore be detected by the eye. It should be mentioned that D is so made that between its bottom and the bottom of the saucepan is a space of about half an inch in depth, and in this space before the apparatus is brought forward is placed a substitute handkerchief sprinkled with a few drops of spirits of wine or eau de cologne to render it more inflammable. Within the saucepan is placed a small live rabbit, after which B is put in its place and pressed down. The performer is now ready to begin the trick. He brings forward the saucepan, holding it as in figure 151, in which position the pressure of the first and second fingers on D prevents it falling off, as being loose it would otherwise do. Placing it on the table, he mixes the bread, cheese, etc. on the plate, and then pours all into the saucepan, where, of course, they fall into B. As B is comparatively shallow, it is well to place the saucepan in some tolerably elevated situation so that the audience may not be able to see into it, or they may perceive that the bread, etc., do not fall to the bottom. The lid is next placed on the saucepan. The hat and handkerchief are borrowed, the latter, which is to serve as fuel, being dropped into the hat. The performer, as if bethinking himself of a possible difficulty, carelessly remarks, We mustn't have the stove too small for the saucepan, and so saying lifts the ladder, as shown in figure 151, and lowers it for a moment into the hat, as though testing their relative sizes. In that moment, however, he relaxes the pressure of his fingers on D, and so leaves it within the hat, placing the saucepan on the table beside it. When he again takes out the supposed handkerchief and sets light to it, it is, of course, the substitute that is actually burnt, the genuine handkerchief, meanwhile, remaining hidden beneath D in the crown. The effect of the flames rising from the hat, in which the audience cannot suppose any preparation, is very startling, and yet, unless the substitute handkerchief is unusually large, or the spirit has been applied with a too liberal hand, there is no real danger of injuring the hat. 
The performer moves about the saucepan above the blaze at such a distance as not to inconvenience the animal within, and, after a moment or two, brings the saucepan sharply down into the hat for the ostensible purpose of extinguishing the flames, but in again lifting it out he brings with it D and places all together on the table. Nothing is now left in the hat but the borrowed handkerchief, which may be restored in any manner which the performer's fancy may suggest. When the lid of the saucepan is removed, as it fits more tightly within B than the latter fits within the saucepan, it naturally carries B with it, thus causing the disappearance of the bread, cheese, etc., and revealing in its place the live rabbit. Some fun may be created by selecting beforehand an assistant from the juvenile portion of the audience and dressing him up with a pocket handkerchief round his head and another by way of apron to act as assistant cook. A guinea pig or small kitten may be substituted for the rabbit, the performer accounting for the wrong animal being produced by supposing that he must have made some mistake in mixing the ingredients. End of section 33